even with the successes, I think there's learnings, right? Even in the first startup, arguably, it could have been a l even bigger if we changed our go-to-market strategy because we had a Skype-like product, but we decided to go via the carriers, mm. right? Which was the sensible route at the time because that was the logical path to market. But as you know, owning the customer these days is in terms of valuation and in terms of how you actually think about your access to those customers and how you can grow them potentially and you're not arm's length from them is is a critical part of success and, and i think it goes to show the difference in valuation for skype at the end Hi everyone, welcome to episode 147 of the Startup Playbook podcast. I'm your host Rohit Bhargava and each week I interview successful founders, investors and subject matter experts on how they got started, strategies they you succeed and their advice to current and future entrepreneurs. I'm delighted to have Wendell Coyneman, the general partner of Tidal Ventures as my guest for this episode. Prior to Tidal, Wendell had over 20 years of deep operational experience, including taking three companies all the way from startups to successful exits. He was the co-founder and CTO of Carbon12, which was acquired by Broadsoft. He was the CTO of Inference, which was acquired by Five Nines. And he was the head of product for Confluence at Atlassian, which IPO'd in 2015 and has now got a market cap of $59 billion. He is now the general partner at Tidal Ventures, which is a $30 million seed stage VC fund that invests into product-centric founders and startups. In this interview, we covered a wide range of topics, including lessons from taking three companies all the way from startups to successful exits, how to develop your product principles, models for effective product management, how to find the right value adding investors for your startup, and much more. Without further ado, here is my interview with Wendell Koineman. Hi Wendell, welcome to the Startup Playbook podcast and thanks so much for taking the time to be in Melbourne and to come on the show today. Thanks Rohit, pleasure to be here. Uh, so Wendell, for those people that may not be as familiar with you or your background, do you want to share a little bit about your story and what got you here today? Yeah, sure. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Wendell Kinnaman, and I'm a general partner at Tidal Ventures. I've been there for the last two or three years when we started to launch Tidal with our uh, second seed fund. Prior to that, I'm actually from the operator background, which is basically on from engineering and product management. So my foray into investment is, it was a transition over the last 25 plus years. And now, now I'm spending my time actually paying it forward with helping the Australian startup community. Fantastic. And obviously, like, I think you've got and you've massively underplayed a lot of your background as well. <laughs> you know, one of the things that I learned from part of my research for this interview is that you're actually a really keen basketball player. Yes, guilty. Very much. I think the peak of my career was university basketball. Got to do the Eastern Conference games and then realizing that I was too short. <laughs> to play in the NBA and <laughs> too small. I still very passionate fan and of, of the NBA and Australian basketball in general. So yeah, huge fan. Yeah, and I know that I've spoken about this with a couple of guests on the podcast, but I just think that there's such an interesting parallel between sports and, and startups or, or business in general. I guess, what are some of the lessons that you took from your basketball days huh. that, that you sort of apply or, or kind of take away and, and sort of apply to your day to day? tenacity. I think I definitely wasn't, uh, I had to really work at my game in order to do that. It didn't come naturally as I would say some other people who just are gifted athletes. Just having to work at, uh, you know, shop mechanics and things like that is just part of honing craft. So, I, you know, I think in my career, I guess I transitioned from engineering to product. So I, I think first part of my career was in engineering for about for first 10 to 12 years. And then I sort of moved into product management of the latter part and then sort of general management and so on. And each time and each change required a change in, in how I would actually function, my mindset and so on and so forth. And actually, like if we're talking about specifics, maybe we can talk about LeBron's career <laughs> because I think he's a classic example of someone who's adjusted his game over the years to actually be a just functional as he gets older and and i know that's more about age but i think in a similar way i, I guess just transitioning from engineering to product to, to all these different forms of management and now i guess on the investment side you can take and apply different learnings from each area and skill set and competency but just being open and curious to how to actually enter that new phase and just not being fearful of it. Often, I think, especially starting young, I think my first startup was when I was 20, 
fifty one and just sometimes sheer ignorance is a good <laughs> is a good part of actually getting into it because if I actually knew what I was in for, I think I wouldn't have done it. you know what I mean yeah, uh, I actually yeah, had yeah. a uh, had a walk in to chat with a friend of mine who's a fellow podcaster, and we were talking a little bit about the process of podcasting he's been doing mm -hmm. it for three years for me it's been close to five and sort of knowing that for the first three years nothing really happens if you mm. knew how hard it is I think most people would normally start but yeah it's kind of interesting getting started but going back you know you mentioned that your first you know your first kind of career trajectory was in engineering but mm. from what I understand even getting to engineering was an interesting story for you because you studied software engineering but you hadn't actually done any computer classes in school is that right yeah that's right so it was definitely a hobby I think I have a story that's not dissimilar to a lot of people I guess back in the day I was given Given my first computer when I was eight, I just really took to it. I was actually not just playing games. Okay, I was playing a lot of <laughs> games, but in amongst that, I was actually programming. I was, it, I just found it fascinating to be able to use a computer. So I, I think sort of age eight, I was sort of getting to understand, I guess, how code could actually automate many things and you could build things. And I think it was sort of just a logical extension of Lego for me, but with sort of infinite possibility. So that's kind of how my first foray into it. But I, I think how, uh, I guess, to answer your question, I was actually enrolled into the Australian Defence Force Academy as well. I actually had that. I could have, I was going into either design and I never did computer science or any kind of computing subjects at, at high school because for me it was always a hobby and just something on the side. And then it was really only around university where I was sort of saying, okay, Adfa was probably too disciplined for me and the design I think perhaps was too down a path of maybe lacking perhaps a career path mm. uh, for me at least. And so I actually just decided to say, well, I actually have this thing on the side that I'm, I think I'm okay at. And why don't I just learn about that? And so it was it's kind of how I actually started. And it was, it was just taking something that I was passionate about and sort of applying it and maybe, maybe a commercial opportunity to do that. And so doing what I love, I guess, in short. So what well, was it, you know, I guess it's, you know, relatively easy to, to say, you know, kind of pick what you love and, and things will kind of work out. But mm -hmm. You know, I can imagine that things can be really difficult. I, I, from what I understand, you've got a Sri Lankan background, I've got an mm -hmm. Indian background. Mm -hmm. What you study is a very, <laughs> <laughs> is a very important thing for uh, you know a really big emphasis that culturally sort of parents parents put on you. Was there anything that kind of helped you through that, through that kind of decision making process that you know again you sort of probably had multiple different options, but you decided yeah. to go down the software engineering path. Yeah, actually, the fact that I was just doing tertiary education was was tick. Right, so I think anyone out there with parents of either Asian origin or otherwise would possibly know the fact that you know you are you tend to get routed through the the mainstays, professional services, and so on and so forth. I think my parents are pretty open. My dad was from finance background; he was in banking for years, and my my mom was more in I guess the art side. So I think I had those two worlds that allowed me to maybe experiment for want of a better term. I think the real, the real test actually came when I had done a few years of engineering in you know, a company that was supporting my, my tertiary postgrad education as well. And then at that time, I just decided to, to drop out of that whole process and start a company, not knowing what that would hold. I had an idea. I used to always like, I had a, I had a really awesome manager and mentor who we used to have really, really, I would say passionate and robust debates with. And I realized like I need to scratch this itch, right? And so I just decided to start a company, not knowing exactly what that meant. And that was probably the first test of the family <laughs> sort of saying, hey, what's going on here? Everything up to now was probably, uh, you know, <laughs> okay, but this is, this is a bit testing. So that was, was probably a difficult moment. Mm. I convinced them, but I, I'll tell you what, I think it, it also came down to my personality, which was, you can't tell me, no, I'll find, you know, I, I think it's, it's, for me, it's energy. Mm. It just, it gives me energy to sort of say, there's a reason to do it. Not, not for, just for stubbornness sake, but it's more to, to prove you wrong, to say that I think there is a path here. And so that, that's kind of how it was, it was uncomfortable to, uh, at family functions though, around like, Hey, when are you going to 
quit and get a real job type of thing. Yep. I'm sure a lot of entrepreneurs out there have probably heard that story from their own families or friends. But I think these days, I mean, back then, this you got to understand, like, this was after the dot-com era. So this is mm. around 2000. Probably not the best time to start a company. If everyone remembers, the dot-com bubble had just burst. <laughs> and if you're in a tech company, they're probably not the greatest time to start something. But like I said, I think a bit of naivety is, is helpful sometimes. Definitely. Mm. Definitely goes a long way <laughs> as well. So, yeah, can you, can you share a little bit about what that company was and, and the journey that you went on? Yeah, sure. So the first company is called Carbon12. It was it's basically a services company at the start. So we, you know, just again, 2000, you got to sort of cast your mind back 21 years. And we, were, we productized a custom content management system. And that was kind of our first, first foray of kind of going into product land. But over that time, I was sort of researching some other opportunities that we could explore. And one of those was in the telecommunication space. So it was really around building end user applications for in the voice space. And we started researching this and we started looking at, you know, the next generation of a voice application. So there's been anyone's in the telco space is voice over IP, which I think is just voice to everyone these days. And there was a sort of a generational shift. So back in the day, it used to be big iron in, in telco sort of knocks and exchanges, and it sort of was shifting over to software-based infrastructure. And so they needed all, a new generation of a switching and capabilities that were in line with the shift to cloud. Okay, so this is probably the very, very, very early days of cloud. So often... Before, now, I think everyone takes for granted that the, the telcos are now basically the, the pipes mm. that run all of the platforms that we're all using, but that was the start of that whole journey into cloud. And so this company was really forging the first generation of user-facing applications. So the three apps that we really built and were firstly an end-user-facing application like Skype. Right, so it was a desktop application for business to business where you could sort of see call notifications on your desktop, sort of a soft phone capabilities and messaging, all that sort of stuff. It would integrate back into a call center. The second one was a receptionist application for front of office. And the third one was a sort of a contact center capability. Mm. It's when we built that sort of third one on the way there, that's when we got acquired further down the road. And from what I understand, after that, you had a second company? That you launched as well yeah so after so that was like sort of when when we made that transition from full product company we got acquired in 2005 i actually it was it was kind of one of those earn out situations where we got acquired by this company called broadsoft broadsoft was heading into an ipo but they were it was also heading into the global financial crisis i also moved to the us at that time mm. <laughs> so Got to see some really amazing things during that time, but also and, and sort of be part of that U.S. culture of uh, entrepreneurship and startup building, which was a hell of an experience. I really I think I really developed my product management transition chops there as well, because I was basically moving from engineering at this point into to product or the latter part of my part of in product. And then eventually fast, fast forward past GFC and they had floated. So it was my first opportunity to see a startup go all the way through to a listed company. Mm. And that was a hell of an experience, right? To see a company scale like that. You know, fast forward, Broadsoft is now actually a Cisco company. They got acquired as well after they listed not, actually not too long ago. The second company is Inference. So I got involved. Uh, they were a spin out of Telstra Research Laboratories. They were actually a services company. They're actually a Mel Melbourne based company. They actually were doing some really interesting work. So it was a speech company that but they were building kind of one-off stuff and they needed somebody to come in and run product that could actually shift it into a product company so I kind of joined as CTO and then sort of transitioned to COO and that was really building a a studio product that you could drag and drop voice scripts and applications so you could build speech-based applications so an example could be if you're spotless you know uh, the company that sort of does the cleaning service and so on you could actually if you're a person who doesn't have a soft phone or something like that you could actually call into when you check in you know like the old mm. bundy clock kind of thing <laughs> you check in and you could use voice voice biometrics to verify 
if you've been registered on the system and you can check out in the same way no matter where you are when you're on premise and they could GPS tag that and so on. So that's an example of some of the things you could do. We had customers like AFL and Virgin Airlines and stuff like that using it. So I actually left that company to go back to Atlassian because when I returned to Australia after the Broadsoft stint, I actually walked, did, did a stint at Atlassian, left, did this company. But once they got operational, I think the folks at Atlassian were asking me to come back for potentially a, a bigger role there. And I really enjoyed my time at Atlassian. So I actually left that company because they were operationally sound at this time. And yeah, they just got acquired by Five Nines recently. So, so that was late last year. They got acquired by a public list company, Five Nines. So, so it was the second time, I guess, where I had the opportunity to sort of see a company's transition over and how to scale a company to get it to either a successful exit or a, an exit through an acquisition to a listing, listed company. So, so that was really a, a really fab journey as well. Yeah, yeah, absolutely fascinating. And, you know, obviously you've kind of touched on Atlassian mm-hmm. uh, as well. You know, I, th- I think in a previous conversation, you'd mentioned that you'd sort of come back to Australia and, and felt like your career was over um, <laughs> in a sense, because, you know, ev- obviously everything that kind of happens and at scale, the velocity mm-hmm. and, and the sheer volume of things in the US is, is so different. To, to Australia. And I think the, the way that you found found out about it last year was really interesting as well. From what I understand, mm-hmm. just walking down the street and, and seeing a sign. Do you want to share a little yeah. bit about that story? Yeah, sure. You got to understand this is probably 2010 when I came back. We came back from family reasons. And the comment about the thinking the career was over, I think I said that once and I think everyone was sort of feeling that I was a bit, being a bit down about the Australian ecosystem. But in fact, actually, it was more just the fact that Having spent so much time in the US at that point, it was, I guess it was a really invigorating, I think, you know, especially in the Valley, as well as on the East Coast, there was, there's just, you live and breathe that over Mm. there. Coming back, I think at that time, this is still, remember about, you know, 10, 11 years ago, it was, I wouldn't say the, I'd say the ecosystem was still earlier stages, right? There was some, there was still some, I mean, Alassian was still, I would say early uh, on the horizon. And it was really only about five years later, six years later, I think you started to see some of the sort of the names that people are, are familiar with from the Australian ecosystem. So back then, I think it just felt like it was a backward step. Mm. But the reality was, you know, I just had everything ahead of me. So the, <laughs> the coincidence was I was literally walking with my partner down Sussex Street back in the day they were in this building called the corn exchange literally where they did sort of corn trading back in the day and they had a sign at the front of the office that said you know 30 for 30 or something like that and they were hiring a bunch of people at the same time and so i was just curious what the sign meant and i just walked in i literally just walked in i I, we were just actually just going on some walk around the city the weird part was i wasn't interviewing but i ended up kind of interviewing right there and then (laughs) so so it was uh i ended up just saying hey what's this about then i got introduced to the vp of product at the time and that sort of turned into a a longer conversation Mm. that sort of turned into a partial interview and then I came back another day and, and uh, they, you know, they offered me a job to, to start. It was probably a little bit more of the, the Wild West back then, the way they were hiring and stuff. I'm sure it's a lot more structured now. But yeah, it was a really, really fun experience because I think when I did that first time, I just met Mike. Just Mike came out <laughs> and then Scott came out. And so it was a very odd experience, but it was, it was definitely got me across the line. Yeah. And, and what was, I guess, your impression of the early days of Atlassian now? Obviously, you know, mm-hmm. and now it's kind of known as one of, if not the Australia's most successful mm-hmm. sort of startup that's, that's kind of happened over the last 20 years or so. Mm-hmm. But I imagine things were a little bit different. And from what I understand, again, you hadn't heard of Atlassian the, as, as a business entity yeah. prior to that? Yeah, I, I think, and it wasn't just me. I, even when we'd have our customer summits at the time, the, the Atlassian brand was actually second to the product brands. Mm. So I'd actually meet people and say, you know, I work for Atlassian and they say, oh, okay. And then, and then I'd say, have you heard of Jira or have you heard of Confluence or something like that? And they're like, oh, yeah, we use that. And so it, was, it wasn't until they elevated their investment in the, the 
the brand of the company as part of you know the IPO and just just awareness. The products were the ones, and it just sort of actually goes to show how product led they were and how powerful the brands they'd built. In not just I guess the development uh, parts of the organization, but the broader parts of the organization because it certainly permeated beyond that and that that's really what sort of brought all of their success and so really the 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 company brand sort of just came as a secondary piece so Mm. hence the reason yeah and you know obviously atlassian's been on an absolutely incredible journey you've just spoken about your two previous uh, experiences as well you know oftentimes for a lot of founders their kind of dream is to have one journey of kind of launching something and seeing that to to exit you've done that three times now Mm -hmm. what are some of the i guess similarities between the the different products that you went through that that made them successful in their Mm. own industries and verticals Mm. yeah look even with the successes i think there's learnings right so Mm. i think you were just sharing your story about your own experiences look even in the first startup arguably it could have been a even bigger if we changed our go-to-market strategy because we had a skype-like product but we decided to go via the carriers Mm. Right, which was the sensible route at the time because that was the logical path to market. But as you know, owning the customer these days is in terms of valuation and in terms of how you actually think about your access to those customers and how you can grow them potentially and you're not arm's length from them is is a critical part of success. And and I think it goes to show the difference in valuation for Skype at the end. But, you know, we learned a lot of things along the way. The similarities I'd say is, I think in every endeavor, it really was a product-led effort that attracted Mm. me to each of those organizations, whether it was my own, partially my own, or, you know, I was sort of effectively leased out (laughs) to uh, look after a product that was much loved by many people. So in every case, I think it was really around putting the product first and then working through a set of principles that allow other people to make decisions as well on those products. So it's probably another thing to expand on. Later. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, just yeah. like I'd love to sort of double click on that as well. Mm. You know, can you elaborate on, on what you sort of mean in, in terms mm. of setting those principles to, to mm. enable people to make the right product decisions? Yeah, I think it's it's about, it's, it's not dissimilar to principles that you have in your own life or mm. on your person. It is really a set of beliefs and trade-offs that you you can actually stipulate that allow you to sort of say that this is something we optimize for over that, right? And we still, we still always have these games of sliders where you could say, you know, where's the, where's the dial more optimized for on the spectrum? And, and often, you know, for, for principles around a product, you'd have a few few principles that you would allow decision making to happen in a in a scalable way so so that was one example of where i think when i had to sort of turn my attention say into the first company and second company to allow for other people to make decisions on my behalf mm. on the product i knew i could leave and sort of either do founder sales or for example work on i don't know partnership arrangement or potentially dive into some operational issue i could have things move on with that and I know I know that's hard to sometimes articulate but sometimes it's an important facet to say like this is what that product stands for and so that's I'll give an example as sort of around simplicity because you know an example is probably this is it's maybe a contrived example but it's still important there are a lot of products that we we kind of have either in our portfolio or otherwise and and depending on the target audience it's really important to sort of say what level of feature functionality is is applicable and particularly say for example is it a low code environment you know for non-technical audience or less technical audience then that hallmark of keeping that simplicity yet keeping a, a detail level of functionality under the hood is more relevant than say a power user product that is or an api based product or otherwise that is about actually promoting the full full gamut of dials and knobs and switches that you need that particular audience to have so just varying that that slider on that spectrum is really important in the context of your audience and so on that's just one example. So Wendell, really curious on that point in terms of building those principles and just understanding those decision making. Like principles, whether it's core values of the business or mm. you know the principles around your product can be really, really important decision making points, but it can be really hard for startups to understand what those principles or what those values should be or kind of articulate them in a way that you can then pass on and translate to the rest of your team. Mm. 
any advice on you know founders that you've worked with or portfolio companies and what that sort of initial step of that process should look like for them to identify what those principles or, or those values are? Look, I would actually say for particularly for the the stage that we invest in, which is really seed stage, I think those are formative years for a founder and understanding even the journey that they're going on with the product and the market that they're they're supporting to to actually come up with those principles takes time so forcing it isn't necessarily the advice i would give it is really around almost like journaling and being reflective about what it's for what it's not and just sort of diarizing that to a degree and then over time because i think it's hard to actually say because like where it really matters is when you're say hiring your first product manager or you're hiring an engineer that is probably going to do some of that product work or backlog grooming or something like that is going to take that forward a little bit for you that's when you really need to start thinking about it and and naturally that comes with a uh, a certain level of scale right Mm. and the argument would be that you would you would have adequate traction and adequate information from the market and just the feedback on the product to to help you start f- formulating some of those principles so first first thing is don't force it because it has to come with time and maturity often it's it's sort of and i wouldn't necessarily say revenues <laughs> is in, is the right indicator but it really is around that education around what what the product is helping the user do. Mm. We always sort of say if it's a product-led uh, opportunity, it's really around how am I making this user base successful and what what dictates the health of the product. And I think those are good indicators of how you can come up with those principles because once you understand what the scoring, and I just actually just talked to a startup recently about this, is once you understand the, the scoring and what, the proof points of what your audiences are trying to achieve that can help really guide some of these principles so i gave an example around simplicity it could be around how i think for example in confluence it was very much a case of we want to retain being a horizontal product Mm -hmm. right so the idea being and just i'll expand on that is a horizontal product rather than actually verticalizing for a particular audience or a use case it will we'll try and solve that through the marketplace or ecosystem, mm. right? So Trello's like that, Confluence was like that, and that was a it, that can potentially be frustrating to a, a broader range of audience. But the reality was that we we did have a number of people using the product in that way, and so it, we we lent on our marketplace vendors to verticalize some of the use cases as a result. So if you wanted to use it for documentation, there would be potentially some plugins or add-ons that could to solve that problem for you rather than us actually going down that path. Yeah. And so that that was a trade-off that mm. we were willing to make around our principles. So, yeah. yeah, it's interesting. Yeah. And, you know, I imagine the size and scale of those trade-offs change as, mm-hmm. as the company kind of matures and, and scales over time as well. In terms of those product principles specifically, mm-hmm. You know, do they get revisited at all? Is that like a periodic thing where they're assessed whether like are these actually the right principles and you know have we evolved past that particular point or, or those sort of things? Again, can you share what that what that process looks like? Absolutely. I think the main thing is around what again, as as you say, the journey with the the, the product is an evolutionary one. There are there are a number of cases where we we had to sort of take different perspectives and, and each each iteration of those was a learning experience where we could potentially adopt a new principle. And it's, it's kind of, think of it as a living document, right? That is versioned effectively. And while there was no formal process around this, and I think for a startup, it is really around your, I guess for want of a better term, your product council, because often in an early stage startup, you're not gonna have formalized roles around this. Certainly in a company like Atlassian, where you would have triads and functional expertise, that that would be a process that we would go to, but in a in a sort of an earlier stage start, that would be like your council, mm. right? So uh, you get those folks together and each iteration around either taking from customer success, customer support, I'd probably say every six months would be a probably a good enough cycle to, to start reviewing those kinds of principles and learnings, specifically around you know jobs to be done and use cases that go through. Those are, those are some of the reasons why uh, you might want to revisit those because you 
expanded into a new audience or yeah. you've potentially you've created some new functionality that you perhaps didn't envisage at the start. So, you, you know, I can imagine with a lot of these revisiting of these principles, mm. part of it is setting them up and then mm. another part is getting the rest of the team to buy into that. Yeah. When, you know, as you mentioned, you know, the very early stages of a business will be very different to the later stages of a company and, and the requirements that they go through. How do you get team members to sort of buy into to the new sort of principles for, for the product? A good question. I th- think it's really just, I think just like any cultural set of beliefs, it really is around setting these, and I call them principles largely because these are what we believe to be the, um, and I, I think in some places, I wouldn't say people have left <laughs> for, for that, but sometimes there are differences of opinion around like the direction directionally where the product is headed mm. and that can cause friction. I don't think it's as gone as far as at least as people have sort of left, but I think it can be uh, a little bit of a, I would say, you know, a, a type of religion in the sense that people get pretty fanatical about those different types of uh, parts that, that, that a product can take. How do we get alignment? I think the main thing is around trying to keep objectivity around it and helping the customer be the lens that you see through Mm. and allowing the, you know, as I said, having the customer be the the lightning rod for for success and having that things like health score and maturity and things like that, how Mm. we sort of navigate a customer from, I always sort of take this example of saying, Back, you know, if you're when you're in student, you used to have the old bell curve of you know proficiency and so on, and you know you'd sit sort of you know in the middle or um, so on. Reality is often less a bell curve and more like a distribution curve. And the reality is that most of the time, that's how I try and think about taking the success of a user from start to finish. So. The idea is that a percentage of your base would be novices, a percentage would be sort of proficient, and the other percentage would be advanced, right? Mm. For me, the reason why I put it on that distribution is because the reality is if you look at every product as somebody's trying to achieve and get a job done and, and see success, then it is really around saying, how do I take that person through that, that maturity curve? And that's what I mean by health. So when you when I sort of ask founders like what the vitals are for their product, I'm really asking them not about their revenue and so on and so forth. It's around what does healthy usage patterns look like in your product and how you actually develop those over time by you know introducing either new features or helping them wayfind or even sometimes in, in some occasions where you have like human assisted uh, help throughout the way. One of the people that I did get to speak to in doing research for this interview is one of your portfolio founders, Craig, who mentioned that, you know, one of the real benefits of having you involved with with the business is particular frameworks that you've helped them set up as a business that they now Mm -hmm. utilize. Are you able to share what what some frameworks are that that founders may be able to to use and apply for their own business? Yeah, so Craig is from a company called Sonder. The the interesting thing about the, the discussion with Craig is that they weren't always a portfolio company. I was just sitting at a breakfast, which was uh, just a bunch of product folks in the community together. And and he was just serendipitously sitting next to me. And he's like, hey, check out my app. <laughs> so <laughs> I, you know, I ended up talking to, there was a lot of interesting people there, but then I ended up getting sucked into this conversation with Craig and in, in, a, in a good way. We actually, we hit it off. He was, he's a really awesome guy. And we just started talking. And to be honest, like they, they were working in a space that was very, I think I was quite uh, passionate about, which is mental well-being and health and safety of, of individuals. I won't go into what the company does in more detail. You can check them out. But, but I, I just started helping them. They weren't in the portfolio. And at the time, I think this was uh, early sort of 2018, I was just really just providing some advisory for him because we, we you know, got, got to be friends and but there were key moments in that company's journey that where I started engaging them on just just how how to think through stuff. So I think one example possibly was around how to do pricing and packaging. Mm. Uh, that was probably something more recent. I, I sort of ran them through, you may be familiar with this, is sort of Brian Balfour's four fits model. And, and that was really relevant because what they 
were on a journey was was understanding that they kind of had a b2c model and a b2b model and Mm -hmm. how to try and shoehorn (laughs) a couple of different uh, models through uh but but having very different customer bases wasn't going to work and had needed to think through and how to kind of not fork the product but potentially navigate the product in a way that would be suitable for the different go to market so you know as as they say it's 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 not product market fit it's market product fit the four fits expands on that so it sort of starts looking at channel and also looks at sort of pricing as well uh, mm. model uh, specifically so it looks at the model and business model of how you're actually tailoring for that channel to market as well as in their case they had multiple channels and so they they were not hitting home with both so so that was a really useful framework that they could actually take at the board level and and rethink how they could actually tap into those different spaces that they were already being successful in so so it's just it's just enabling different founders and and not every founder works through frameworks right so, some folks like to work through a theory and it's about tailoring the i guess the 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 coaching or to how they actually think as well you know, and, and I know that you've worked with several companies and now more formally with, with Tidal as well. Mm-hmm. Again, just wanted to kind of take a step back. I mm-hmm. think it was around 2018 that you left mm-hmm. Atlassian and were sort of trying to figure out what, what to do next. Mm-hmm. And I think that you had sort of three questions that you, or kind of three key areas that you wanted to hit and wanted to find something that, that hit all of them. You know, I think that's often a process that a lot of people go through is, you mm-hmm. know, finding themselves at a stage where they've kind of transitioned on or kind of forced into having to make a bit of a career change. And it can be really difficult to understand what path to take, Mm -hmm. uh, particularly when you've got multiple different options in front of you. Again, do you mind sharing what that sort of journey was like for you and and what those three questions were that helped you sort of find what you wanted to do with Tidal? Yeah. So this was, I was leaving Atlassian. I, I think I'd sort of been there for quite some time at this point and I was looking to, to sort of do something new. I think the the logical path would be just to to you know take on a, a a VP of product role something like that, and often I I I think having been sort of either founded a company or sort of joined some really great startups that have sort of gone on to great successful things, I, it was a logical path for me. But I I force myself, and this is very difficult if people know me, <laughs> to sit still for some time and just reflect. So we went on. Bit of, did a bit of a sabbatical. This is not uncommon. I'd highly recommend that for people who are actually sort of coming out of something big, good or bad or otherwise. It just gave me some time to think. So the, the sort of the Elon Musk master plan, sort of simpl- simplicity in terms of actually relaying it that, uh, I just sort of came up with there's three things that I really want to do. I think have even even I loved the, the time at Atlassian, but I think the first one was I wanted to found something again do something from scratch. I think there's there's something really amazing about starting something anew and something creative about it and that process. So I uh, wanted to do that again. It'd been nearly sort of five to uh, eight, nearly eight years, I think, if in total for both stints. So I was a boomerang person. Uh, the second one was, I think at this time, I kind of want, I really wanted to give back to the Australian startup community. This is important because I, I think having done it sort of twice and having really understood, I guess, what the scaling means and sort of different, ha- having different roles in those organizations as well, wearing several different hats. I didn't get a lot of the help that I feel like is there now. And I, I felt like I had something to contribute. So, so that was the second part. And the third part was I w- wanted to do something with purpose. So a um, partner I really care about climate and we, we wanted to do something around that. Right. So, so I was, that's all I had at the end of the sabbatical. I didn't really have an application of that, but I just had those three things. So for me, again, I guess maybe if you're sort of dovetailing back into the principal things, those kind of the, were, were the three overarching uh, things that we wanted to kind of optimize for. And then how, how it sort of transitioned is I started investing, right? Mm-hmm. And so uh, I think many people have either started an angel way or some, otherwise I actually invested through a fund and that was probably the precursor to title. It was a fund called the Adventure Fund, 
which we we call Fund One really now. It's rebranded, <laughs> and so th- that's kind of how I started that journey. the The temptation was to just do the logical path because I literally was tested because I, I had was fortunate enough to actually get offered sort of three jobs, and it was it was it was only when I turned it down where I actually was tested on the discipline of following those those three principles right mm. it's it's when you actually get tested and that's probably actually i'll probably come back to that product thing the the, the benefit of a principle is whether you can you can test it and action it right so whether it applies to culture i think i've had a lot of founders ask me about what makes a great cultural value and it's i said it, it's again it can you know people can use it as a decision framework it's actionable Right. And in the same way, this one was as well. So saying no, I think that was actually the real saying, like, I'm not just taking the, an opportunity. I'm actually using these principles to, to, to see the lens as a lens. Lo and behold, the investing thing was actually the thing that ticked all of the boxes because I think through the work that I'd done with Adventure Fund, because I, even though I was an LP, I actually realized that the, I was doing really good work with the portfolio because they, it started off as a entrepreneur in residence, as it were. And that tra- transitioned very quickly into saying, hey, do you want to come on as a GP in our next fund? And so, and that really transitioned into what we know, now know as title. And so that's kind of the, the thing. It definitely ticks the second box. And the third box, if you're wondering how that works, is I've just made a commitment that all of my carry is going into a foundation for, for climate. So my wife and I started, so... So that's, um, that's, that's how I take the third one. Yeah. And it's, it's incredible as well. And I think your point around it being tested, mm-hmm. but like, I think it's easy to make a principle that you will sort of stick to hundred percent of the percent of the time. I think it's when things get really challenged and you're mm-hmm. like, oh, actually, exactly. you know, do we really how, like, how much do we really believe in this particular principle? We're we going to follow through when it's a little bit harder to make that decision that, that it really counts. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. And, you know, as I said, culturally those are those are those are really good examples where we were tested often at Alassian with because I think Alassian values are pretty famous now mm. I think especially how they're written and there were times where they were I wouldn't say abused but I think maybe misinterpreted mm. I always sort of say when we talk about our values the value should be additive as well so the this value should be at the expense of another Mm. They should be work in harmony together. And so you can't, like, somebody can't claim this value and say, I'm doing this thing. We had times where people were talking about open company, no bullshit, but then, you know, at the cost of not playing as a team or something like that, mm. right? So so those are the sorts of things where times we would, we, you, you, you have to use those together and uh, they, they have to be additive and, and interweaved in order to do that. So you can't just pick and choose what, what, what your poison is today, right? Yeah, yeah. no, absolutely. Yeah. And at Amazon, we have something similar as well, which is you can't weaponize our leadership principles as yeah. well. So there's yeah. 14. We, we make a lot of the decisions. Everything when it comes to hiring is made with a clear lens of those leadership principles. But day-to-day decisions, one of the things that you're told not to do is you never weaponize them yeah. because that's that's not what they're what they're intended they're for. Intended for. Yeah, they're just guides. They're gui- guidelines and, and, and hopefully they're things that people can use every day, right? Yeah. To make healthy decisions. So yeah. 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 Absolutely. You you know, obviously fascinating what you're what you're doing and your background as well, I think is so unique in, in the ecosystem. You know, oftentimes and you know obviously having spoken to a lot of your portfolio founders as well, you know, oftentimes there's a, a lot of founders think that they're getting a lot of value add from from their VCs or, or that's what a lot of VCs say, but uh, very few have kind of the operational experience that, that you bring to, to the table. Can you share what that looks like from a title perspective in your portfolio companies in terms of when you sort of roll up your sleeves and, and help on the product side? What can founders expect? And and I guess, what can they sort of lean on you for help with? Yeah, sure. So so just, just a bit of background and context. The title is a seed stage fund. Actually, while we focus on seed, we, we assist companies through the institutional life by sort of series a b we also pride ourselves on being an operator-led fund we have folks like myself who have actually been in the industry as well plus our lps often i would say op- former operators plus we have a healthy network title expert network of people that we sort of call upon to to sort of scale as well as you know there's, there's certain expertise that we can all draw upon but 
because we've got a pretty diverse group of people in our team. So we have, we have folks in Sydney, coverage for Melbourne, as well as uh, we have Andrea based in New York, because, you know, for us, it's really about transitioning into a sort of biggest market and having that sort of chaperone and landing, safe landing over there is, is really beneficial. The key thing is, like, if you're going to invest, and particularly for Australia or across a range of diverse categories, uh, we're, we're largely thematic-based investors. So we'll develop um, and research different areas, like, you know, whether it's infrastructure, cyber, productivity and automation, there's there's a number of different thematics that we'll we'll look at and then from there we will probably use our operating capabilities to kind of seek out companies in that space and so there's a couple of companies that that we found recently that sort of meet those thematics and then we kind of go and try and talk to them about it and I think that often drives a really great conversation as well so for us I think by having that sort of deep understanding and lens around product and go to market which obviously are critical capabilities for companies at this early stage of growth. I think founders naturally gravitate to us. We often get our best sort of source of interest in, from referrals really in, in, our, in our network because founders have had really great experiences with us and they understand the level that we go to. And so, you know, we, and we write about it. We write about it, we talk about it. I'm just about to publish a blog on pricing packaging. Previously, we were talking about out of, out of the demo we talk about seed and the investing stages because i think we try and australianize our content because mm. seed here uh series a here series b here is, is, has slightly different calibrations to the u.s market we're far more capital efficient i think so so those kinds of things and making it accessible to to our audience is really really valuable to them absolutely i'll make sure uh, i add a link into the show notes for your blog sure. As well. sure. So when did you, you just mentioned that, you know, title focuses on specific themes. Really curious to know, uh, I guess, how you develop those themes as well. Mm-hmm. You mentioned that you do a little bit of research, but also can you give us an example of what some of those themes look like for you as well? Sure. Yeah. So one of the themes is, say, for example, around low code, no code, but it's around low code, no code for a particular functional area. So call it sort of functional no, no code or low code sort of a pun but the idea is really around how you tap in using uh, low code and no code into a particular functional area that has been maybe void of tools or maybe powerless Mm. in accessing those tools another one is probably around observability Uh, you may be familiar with tools like Splunk and Mm. Datadog Dynatrace and so on Uh, those tools have been largely for engineering teams up to now those, those have been fairly powerful tools uh, in able to assess, diagnose, and monitor things that are happening uh, in, in, I guess, the product realm. Those tools have been difficult to uh, access for front of house. Uh, we've made an investment in a company that's stealth right now that will announce sort of soon that that is actually in this space. we sort of bringing that capability to front of house to allow... I guess basically around people like you know who are supporting the product, who are making the product successful, basically have a- access to similar types of information, and empowering them to be able to service the the you know the front of house as just as well as the back of house. Fantastic, yeah. and you know one of the other people that I got to speak to in doing research for this interview was another one of your portfolio founders, Matt mm-hmm. Matt Barnett, who you know mentioned that you've initially joined as a uh, observer of the board. Mm-hmm. And he said that, you know, after working with you was really a no-brainer um, in terms of bringing you on as, as a full-time board member as well for the business. But, you know, it's, it's been really curious to see, obviously, Tidal has, uh, you know, just launched the fund, uh, I think it's within the last two years. Oh, yeah, so. yeah it's last year. Yep. Last year. Yep. Yep. You know, and it's been interesting to see from an ecosystem perspective, there are a lot more funds and a lot more capital that's out there, which I think is mm. fantastic for the ecosystem. One of the more challenging parts for founders now, and it's a great problem to have, is there are a lot more options on the table as well. Mm. And so for founders that are potentially in a really fortunate position to have multiple term sheets on the table and kind of their choice of funds, any advice on how founders should think about, you know, finding what the right the right investor or the right fund is for them? Yeah, so I think even when I was doing my startup, I think I always look for something beyond the money. So firstly, I would say, uh, smart money, if people say any things beyond the check or what's to that, that extent. I think with the weight of capital, certainly in the US, but more so here, 
the things are changing and access to capital is better, either through funds or grants or so many other different paths. So I think that's a very important part of it. And that can come in the form of, you know, venture and the sort of the people that come with that, or it could even just be through an advisor network or otherwise, right? Mm. So so that that's super important. But it's really ultimately about a relationship. So irrespective of that, it should be around, I always sort of say this is, and, and I think this may be my advice around raising as well. I think we have a lot of founders sometimes that, that have not done it before and they sort of say, hey, we're raising now and we need this done in two weeks. But really, <laughs> I think for the benefit of everybody involved, it shouldn't be rushed. It should be about dating, getting to know each other for a while, because it is a marriage. You are together for quite some time, or you hope it to be that way, because it, it is a, a relationship, that, because you want to actually have that person on that journey with you for a for, the longest possible time, because for the reasons that you got together uh, should be for, that should stay. Right. Mm-hmm. And, and those reasons could be around situational strategy, a domain expertise. It could be around product and uh, market capabilities. And that's often the latter is something that we, we get tapped on for quite regularly because I think that is the plight of an early stage company is, is finding that market product fit. And, you know, hiring, access to network, entering a new geo, those are all things that are probably top of mind. So I think I always look at it as what is your horizons that you see and then how you think about the match that you're going to make with that. And and I guess, you know, it's talking about the th- themes and thematics that we talked about earlier. Sometimes we are actually out looking for a match as well. Mm. And I think there's a re- there's an unannounced company that we've invested in where uh, when we met them, we pitched them, right? Because they they did, they were in this situation where mm. they did have uh, many people who were interested in investing. They had a, a hell of a story to tell, terrific founders. And I pitched to them because we, we were actually pitching our thematic back to them because I think it's an alignment exercise. And, you know, when that whole dating process that I talked about earlier, for me, it's it's an alignment exercise. And I think some of the best founders I've talked to, they have really hard questions for me mm. as well. And, and I know that that means that they've been thinking deeply about the relationship and what they want out of it as well. You don't, I, I think with the capital out there, it, you don't necessarily have to be cocky about it, but I think assertive around like what you want out of a, a VC or, or some kind of funding is, is important. And, but give yourself time, right? Give yourself time to actually have that experience and understand who you want to partner with. So, so those would probably be my my tops top picks. Great advice. Yeah. And speaking of advice, you know, final question for for me as well. One of the other things that that Craig mentioned that he's got a lot of value from and really said was your kind of superpower was just taking all of this information and. Before we turned on the mics, we kind of spoke about how much content and information there is, and it's really hard for founders to, to distill that. And one of the things that he mentioned he really enjoyed or got a lot of value from working with you is just your ability to distill the right information, give the right amount of information, the right level of detail at the right time. Mm-hmm. And I think that's such an important skill because it can be really easy to overwhelm people. Mm. How do you, like, what's your process to, to distill that kind of information? How do you sort of understand what what the right level and detail of, of information is to, to give to your portfolio founders I think it's a skill that I've I didn't always have I would say so it's a skill I probably developed through communicating with stakeholders managing up managing down sideways and so on but also like even when you're working with your team how to like if, if you want to make something actionable how do you bring it down to its the absolute sort of pure essence to allow them to actually act on it. And that, I mean, at the end of the day, at, you know, if, if I'm working on a portfolio project, that's what it's got to come down to, right? Because if if it's just a verbal, you know, blurt of, of things that you sort of share, I think the signal to noise ratio is high at that point. And what they take out of it is, is going to be mixed. So uh, for me, the process is really trying to get it down to i was sort of working the the ones threes and fives kind of um, principle around like distilling it into sort of 
distinct points and just making sure it's very clear to them around the why behind every single one of those. Because often, I, I actually have been through this process where you think you're being heard, right? And then two weeks later, the conversation still comes up and the realization is you shared that information, but it hasn't necessarily been absorbed in the same way. So I'm, mm. I'm very, very careful now how to distill it, when to distill it, because sometimes you, you can see the road further down the track. I think one of our other companies, they sort of said, you've, you've seen our journey two years in ahead. Yep. And, and, some, and, and I've had to be careful about how to share that advice too early because mm. sometimes, you know, you're like having the, the benefit of experience means you can sort of see the road ahead and that's kind of our job. But, but also sharing that when at a time that's relevant is super important because execution is the now, mm. right? And just as long as they can, you can help them avoid pitfalls around the way and that's, that's a big part of our job, that's, that's what we're there to do. But making sure that it's, it's shared at a time that they're not looking too far ahead that they're stumbling on execution today. Yeah, and I think mm. that empathy piece mm. is really important as well because it can be really easy to go... Clearly, they, they just don't care or they don't understand, but kind of taking ownership over like, actually, did I deliver this in the most effective way possible for them to to effectively absorb the information is yeah. is a big part of that. Yeah, and each person, to each their own, right? Like each mm. each people, uh, each person learns in a different way and and it part of being a coach is delivering in a way that is, is tuned to that person because we all founders are all built differently and they have certain vices and different sort of things that motivate them and it's really about trying to encourage those parts of them without sort of discouraging other parts because i i i have been known to be tough with some of my feedback but also trying to be fair with uh, with a lot of the feedback that i i share i think the good thing is when i do check i do check was that was i too harsh on that most just just about most of the time all the time <laughs> hopefully is is i get the feedback that it's it is it's sort of the tough love mm -hmm. and they know i'm coming from an honest place rather than uh, you know so, some kind of biases or something like that so as i think if we can get that across then i think i feel like i've done my job so fantastic yeah. wendell thank you so much for coming on the show thank you for having me it's been, yeah, it's been absolutely incredible chatting to you for the last hour. For anyone, uh, and I'm sure there'll be no shortage of founders that want to reach out to you as well, but for anyone that wants to find out more, say hello, get in touch, or chat to you about, about what you're doing with Tidal, what's the best way for them to do that? You can reach out to, just jump jump on TidalVC.com and reach out to us that way. We have either, you can pitch us that way, or you can drop me an email and hello at TidalVC.com. Perfect. I will make sure all of those links are in the show notes. Wendell, mm -hmm. once again, thank you so much for coming thank on. You. Cheers. Thanks for listening to episode 147 of the Startup Playbook podcast. As always, full show notes from this interview will be available at startupplaybook.co. I'll be back next week with another episode. But in the meantime, if you enjoyed this interview, please don't forget to like, share and subscribe. As always, thank you for tuning in and I'll see you next week.